You are listening to A Scary State, and this week we're talking about New York. So, Lauren? Yes, Kenzie? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get scary. Remember how last week you were like, I'm so good at this? Yeah, I forgot. I brain farted that I had to actually say so, Lauren. I was just like <laughs> looking at you to respond to me. <laughs> and I was looking at the New York, and I knew that's what you were going to say. But for some reason, when you said New York instead of New Mexico, I was like, mm, are we sure? <laughs> but no, we're, we're sure. We are sure. That I am sure about. Yes, I can see it on my notes. Mm-hmm. New York. New York. I hope so, because that's where my story takes place. <laughs> Wouldn't that be helpful? So, I get scared of that all the time. Same. That I'm accidentally going to do the wrong state, and we'll be like, same. oops. Same. <laughs> same. <laughs> at least we're on the same page with that. Yeah. And we have our notes that, like, literally, every time I'm looking at something, I'm like, okay, need to make sure we're where we are. <laughs> this one, I got so confused, because mine, it takes place, like, all over New York, mm. well, kind of in one spot of New York. But for some reason, talking about it does not sound like it's New York to me. So I kept thinking I was somewhere different. And then I would have to keep going back and be like, this place is in New York, right? And I would look, and it is. But I just... It definitely doesn't help when, like, I'm not familiar with anything there. So I don't know. When it just says a town name, I'm like, in this state, right? Like, you're not referring to another Jones... Well, not Jonestown. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking John, and then, I don't know. Jonestown of all places. (laughs) Smith Street <laughs> or Smith County. Smith County is everywhere. Yeah. So if they say, oh, yeah, this is happening in Smith County, it's like Smith County, Virginia, Smith County, wherever the fuck, like my Smith County that I need to be referring to in the state that I'm working on or a different Smith County somewhere else. Because it's also like Springfield. Yes. There's Springfields and I think it's like, what, 38 states or something. So do we want to? Would you like to tell us about on in? New York? I walk and talk like I live in New York. I drink coffee and my dog drinks water. I think this is what you said last time, too. You might have. (laughs) I probably will say it every time. My cousins from New Jersey do say water. Yeah. Yeah. When I was... (laughs) When I was reading the... One of the articles for it in there, the girl was, like, just talking about how, like, their favorite thing is to get rid of ours. (laughs) There was, I saw on TikTok, there was a guy from Boston who's, like, using Duolingo to try to learn Spanish. Oh, my God. And he was like, they want me to roll my R's, but I don't even say them. (laughs) (laughs) Like, how am I supposed to roll my R's? Oh, my God. It was so funny. It's so bad when we go up to Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. It's all over. And then Joe's uncle doesn't say his R's either, which Mm -hmm. I make fun of him for (laughs) because it just makes me laugh. My grandma, occasionally, when she would say order, it'd be order. Order. All right, New York. (laughs) On 6 million acres with more than 3,000 lakes, rivers, streams, and ponds, the enormous Adirondack Park in northern New York occupies more than 30% of the total land in New York State. You have your pick of outdoor activities, hiking, camping, canoeing, hunting, fishing, trapping, snowmobiling, skiing, mountain biking, and rock climbing should be able to please outdoor enthusiasts seeking adventure, relaxation, or close contact with nature. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, is she going to breathe? See, not all of us need to take the deep breaths. Oh, my God. I was running out of breath just listening to you. (laughs) Today, we were talking about potentially going to another festival. And Mackenzie decided to tell us. She was like, I decided that nature and I don't really need to get along. No, nature and I have a good understanding that um, I belong inside. (laughs) And I accept that. And I tried to tell her RVing is all of the perks of nature without being in nature. Mm. And all the perks of being inside without being inside. Mm-hmm. It's oh, it's a win-win-win. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Within the park, <laughs> the Adirondack Forest Preserve contains 2.6 million acres of state land and thousands of lakes, making it an ideal location for salmon and trout fishing from April through October. The Adirondacks also offer one of the longest seasons of fall foliage in the country, with lovely leaf peeping from early September to mid to late October. Do you call it leaf peeping? I know a lot of people hate that term. Never heard of it till just now. Oh, really? Yep. <laughs> It's just like looking at pretty leaves. Yeah, I don't like that. Peeping makes me feel like you're... Like it's icky. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) After the American Revolution in 1776, New York became a U.S. colony, then a state in 1788. One year later, George Washington was sworn in as the United States' first president in New York City, which was then the country's capital. It would move to Washington, D.C. the next year in 1790. New York was named after the British Duke of York. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Many experts believe it's nick- it's nicknamed the Empire State because George Washington called New York the seat of the empire. Oh. And then did they just name the Empire State Building after that? 
questions, Mackenzie. Important thought. I just thought that fact was was cool. It is cool. But I just I just wonder. I think the nickname came first and then the tower. And then they were like, well, this is what we're called, so we're just going to build the tower. Obviously, the tower came <laughs> after George Washington. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, like, the state nickname came first. And then later down the road, they built the Empire State. Because it's the Empire State, so the Empire State Building. Right. So the nickname had to come first. You knew this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking <laughs> New York is known for supplying construction materials such as limestone, salt, sand, and gravel. It's also one of the top states for garnets, though they're used for industrial purposes instead of jewelry. Is it garnet or garnet? <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. Couldn't tell you. <laughs> and New York is the only state that mines willistonite, used for manufacturing ceramics and paints. Hear the roar of 570,000 gallons. No. 750. What did I say? 570. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that happens with numbers. Sometimes. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Hear the roar of 750,000 gallons of water crashing down every second over Niagara Falls, which borders New York and Canada. If you couldn't die, would you ever go over in a barrel? I'm afraid of heights. You wouldn't see the heights. You'd be in a barrel. Why oh, is such a thing a stupid question? <laughs> New York City is the most populous city in the United States with around 8.5 million residents. You can look down, no, mm -mm. from the 86th floor of the Empire State Building, Not high. climb 377 steps to the Statue of Liberty's Crown, nope. and tour Ellis Island, where over 12 million immigrants entered the United States between 1892 and 1924. So... At the Space Needle, when mm -hmm. I went up into the Space Needle, there was one part where it's a glass floor mm -mm. and you can like walk on it. I had to get down and literally, because I wanted a picture, I had to crawl to the middle because I could not stand because I was scared. And it rotates, so it moves ever so slightly. Yeah, it was very scary. <laughs> there are a lot of things that I want to do that I know damn well I will not be able to do them psychologically. That one was scary. And it was, I don't like elevators, but it was a glass elevator and I can handle glass elevators. But the thing that scared me about this one was I was like, if we get stuck, fire trucks can't get us. We are literally stuck. And how the and elevators are, they're on the outside of the thing. <laughs> Fuck no. Absolutely not. No way. Oh, no, no, no. My eyes would be closed the whole way up, out, beautiful view, stay closed all the way back down. It's pretty terrifying. Yeah. I wish scary. I wasn't afraid of heights because up there is so pretty. I had such nervous poops before. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was so scary and like we got drinks beforehand like we went to some little restaurant and christina and um nora were like oh it ha it's so cute it has this drink i said i literally can't eat or drink a single thing right now i'm so nervous i would have to take a xanax a valium and my uh beta blockers <laughs> <laughs> my heart medication that i'm using for anxiety <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe I'll be just drugged up enough that you could get me to go up there. I did it. All sober. But it's very scared. I'm very scared. New York is the only state that borders both the Atlantic Ocean and the Great Lakes. Oh, oh yeah. I guess it does. Hmm? The sliver of New York. Oh, yeah. The teeniest <laughs> like little bit. It's not even like it says borders, but it's it's just New York City. It touches. <laughs> it poops it. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> The Finger Lakes region in New York is renowned for its natural beauty, encompassing 11 long, narrow lakes that resemble fingers, hence the name. Me. Letch <laughs> Me. Me. <laughs> Letchworth State Park, often referred to as the Grand Canyon of the East, is a natural wonder that captivates visitors with its awe-inspiring beauty. Spanning over 14,000 acres along the Genesee River, the park features magnificent waterfalls. That sounds really pretty. Mm-hmm. The Ausable Chasm, often referred to as the Grand Canyon of the Adirondacks, <laughs> is a remarkable natural wonder that has been sculpted by the forces of nature over thousands of years. For a second, I was like, did I read the same thing? <laughs> Carved by the Ausable River, this stunning chasm features towering cliffs, cascading waterfalls, and unique rock formations, offering a mesmerizing display of geological artistry. There are some th tall things I can jump off of, usually going into water. Oh, I was going to say, what if this sentence is something you would want to jump off of? The, the rocks. I mean, we did used to jump off of the bridge in the reservoir. That was pretty high up there. It was. I was extremely nervous the entire time. But like that I could do because I know relatively 
in those situations, if you fall, it might hurt when you smack the water, but <laughs> that's... Right. You're not high enough that you're going to die. Exactly. As long as you fall towards the water and not towards the gate on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. That was so unsafe. Oh, my God. I can't believe we did that. And <laughs> Your mom willingly brought us there, too. Well, of course she did. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> she was the one taking the pictures of us jumping. <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> The Catskill Mountains, located in southeastern New York, are a beloved natural wonder renowned for their lush forests, crystalline lakes, and captivating vistas. I think that's crystalline. Crystalline lakes and captivating vistas. This picturesque mountain range has inspired artists, writers, and nature enthusiasts for generations, serving as a muse for countless works of art and literature. When we went to the Catskills that one random day, um, there was like a camping park called like Devil's Campground or something. I was like, oh, that's kind of creepy. The Hudson River, often referred to as America's First River, is a natural wonder that has played a pivotal role in shaping the history and landscape of New York. Stretching over 300 miles, the Hudson River flows through picturesque valleys, historic sites, and vibrant cities, offering a tapestry of natural and cultural wonders. I talk about the Hudson River Valley today. Arguably one of the world's most famous parks, Central Park is a 3.5-square-mile parkland in Upper Manhattan. Central Park was the first public park in the United States and is now the most visited park in the country, hosting an estimated 42 million visitors annually. The park covers 341 hectares, hectares, Hect I think it's hectares, hectares, and includes 55 hectares of woodlands, 100 hectares of lawns, and 61 hectares of water in seven man-made lakes or ponds, not to mention the 26,000 trees. If I said that wrong and you had to hear me say the wrong word five times, I really do apologize. Hectare. No, you said it right. Oh, we were close. Yeah. The unit... A square measure equals 100 areas. <laughs> <laughs> what is one area? Here's one area. Oh, okay. So, oh, equal to 100 meter sides. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that would be 10,000 square meters. Makes much more one, sense than... Yeah, so one is... One area. Yeah, so one hectare... Hectare. Hectare <laughs> is 10 square meters. 10,000 square meters. What this means is... All of what you said went in one year, not the other year. <laughs> the High Line opened in 2009 and is a public park built on a historic freight rail line elevated above the streets of Manhattan's west side. Essentially, the High Line is a piece of industrial infrastructure that has been repurposed as a public green space. The 1.45 mile long strip runs from Hudson Yards to the northern corner of Chelsea. The area features wildflowers, outdoor art, and breathtaking views of the city. It's really cool. Looking. That actually sounds really pretty. Mm -hmm. Inwood Hill Park is a genuinely secret gem of Manhattan located in the northernmost corner of the island and consists of enormous trees and a virgin forest. Much of the park is undeveloped and remains in a completely natural state. The park boasts 196 acres of green space, including predominantly deciduous trees. Deciduous. Decidu Why did I say pea? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> predominantly deciduous trees and a salt marsh. This area is prehistoric and visitors can see caves from the time when Native American tribes inhabited the area. My dyslexia is rubbing off on you. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I'll say something and then I'll hear what I said and I'm like, wait, that's wrong. Yeah, I do that too. And then I'm just like, <laughs> well, <laughs> what's happening now? We're going with it. But yes, that's New York. New York nature facts for you. <laughs> yeah, they were all nature facts. I try to keep you consistent. <laughs> I like it. Thanks. All right, after a mini heart attack, Mackenzie, <laughs> what are you telling us for New York? From the top. And the mini heart attack came because when we don't test the microphones, our sound gets all funky, and we didn't test, and I got nervous, and I freaked out. And Lauren is probably by far the most superstitious person I have ever met. We have to do the test <laughs> at the beginning. We have to. What sucks now is that you've gotten me trained so that if we Good. don't i'm like something bad's gonna happen because the one time i didn't say anything the one time i didn't point it out to you our audio sucked yes yes so i learned my lesson the we've way. learned how to communicate with garage band and it hates us if we don't test first mm -hmm. so as long as we test we've got a good bond with it. i also think that the problem is is that if we separate the mics they go through separation anxiety they do they don't like that either and that's why they get all fucked up yeah they don't like that they get very frustrated they don't appreciate being far away just like you and i don't appreciate being far away exactly they have picked up on our personalities <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good Lord. laughs> okay new york <laughs> anyway so this story is an excellent example of forensic science playing a major role in helping solve a murder case which we love yes however what is interesting is some of the facts in this case forensic files left out of the episode oh now there are only 22 minutes but i felt some of the information was important to the story so i did my due diligence and i filled in the holes for you <laughs> amazing yes 
So just a little bit of a trigger warning. This story does cover topics of suicide and child loss. Oh, Mackenzie. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you can say. It's just I know. I know. <laughs> In September 1999, Ronald Cohen was working on getting his house ready to move. So he's moving out. Mm-hmm. He just sold his home of the last nine years in Jericho, Nassau County, New York. Jericho is along the north shore of Long Island and 29 miles east of Midtown Manhattan. In the process of packing up his home, Mr. Cohen was tasked with getting rid of the 55-gallon drum that was in a crawl space near the den. Why are there so many drums? (laughs) Mr. Cohen managed to get the drum out of the curb for sanitation workers to pick it up, but when he checked back the next day, he noticed that the barrel was still sitting there. The sanitation workers left a note saying that the barrel was too heavy for them to pick up, so they wouldn't take it. How heavy was it? We'll get to well, that we'll later. Get to it, I get, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Curious as to what could possibly be in the drum, Mr. Cohen decided to open it up. Mm, he was his hit. first mistake. Well, I mean, if they're not going to get rid of it, you might as well open it. Mm. I would open it. You would also touch the blobs that would make you sick for seven weeks. If that thing's been sitting in my house, hell yeah, I would open it. Mm. I'd be too scared of a true crime situation happening if I opened it. Oh, for sure. When I say I would open it, it means I would make someone else open it so that I could see what's inside. See, I would do that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. wouldn't open it on my own. No, I would no, no, watch no, no, someone no, no, open no. it. I would definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he was hit with a horrendous smell and what looked like a human hand sticking out of a brownish green liquid inside the drum. Mm. Nassau County Police found the body of a woman who was about five feet tall wearing a skirt, button down sweater, high socks, and a shoe with a mid-level heel. She had been submerged in plastic pellets and a brownish-green liquid that was most likely from body decomposition. Mm -hmm. They also found a green plastic flower stem with leaves, an address book, purse, and some jewelry. There was a locket that had the inscription, Patrice, love, Uncle Will. So for those of you youngins, if there are any youngins that listen to this show, an address book (laughs) is what we had to do when... You didn't have contacts in your phone or you didn't, cell phones weren't even a thing. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted to call your friend, you had better had their number either memorized or written down. And then if you wanted to mail things to people, because we used to do that, too, mm-hmm. you had to know where they lived. And so you had an address book. My coworker, she kept meaning to say her contact list on Skype at work, but she kept saying the address, like, I need to look at my address book. And so my other coworker was like, please get with it. It's a contact <laughs> list. It's not an address book. My grandma still calls it an address book. No. In fact, when I was watching the Forensic Files episode, they said pocketbook. I changed it to purse. Hmm. I didn't know people would know what a pocketbook is. Uh, we do. Right. But well, so that's a so that's an address book. It's a place you keep all <laughs> phone numbers and addresses of the people that you want to be in contact with. In a little book. In a little book. <laughs> and it's in alphabetical order. Mm-hmm. The medical examiner, Dr. Gerard Cantonese, determined that the woman was either white or Hispanic in between 25 to 30 years old. She didn't have typical dental work done that you see in the United States. In the States? Or in the States? (laughs) She didn't have the typical dental work done that you see in the United States, which made him think that she was possibly from South America. The medical examiner said that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the skull. He told Forensic Files that the skull had 10 different lacerations to the back and upper part of her head, and her skull was so fractured in some areas that the skull was broken into smaller pieces. Oh, my gosh. There was blood staining around these injuries, which indicated that they occurred when she was alive. Mm. When the examiner x-rayed the body, he discovered a 17-inch fetus, a baby boy, almost a full term. Oh, no. Yeah. Now, some sources say that they didn't actually know the gender of the baby, so maybe the show added it for dramatic effect. Well, I feel like at that point you would know the gender of the baby. Correct. You yourself could find out. But at this point in the discovery of her. I feel like they could. I don't because know. Because if the baby was almost a full term, it's going to have, I would assume, the bone structure that differentiates between like a male and a female. I, I, have no I don't know. Idea. I, I Just saying. Yeah, just I have no idea. Crossing my T's and dotting my I's that... Some said baby boy. Some said that they didn't know the gender. Eh, yeah, it could just be for a dramatic flair. Right. A baby. Mm-hmm. There's yes. a baby in there. Police start off by checking with the owners about where the drum came from. Investigators learned that the house had been built in 1957 and had only five owners. Mr. Elkins, who sold it in 1972. Arthur and Judith Eben, who sold it in 1984. Frank and Bernadette Salmagagi who sold it in 1990, and Mr. Colwyn, who sold it to Mr. Tafagodi in 1999. No one lived there for very long. Uh, Mr. Elkins lived there for almost 20 years. Okay. And the Ebens lived there for 12-ish. 
Yeah, I don't know. That just sounds really short when you – don't you have, like, your mortgage for, like, 30 years or something? Uh, Yeah, but then if you sell your house. Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems, like, short. It was time. also – this was, like, a nice-ass house on Long Island for 400 and something thousand dollars. Oh. Hmm. So I can imagine that these people might have been able to even pay off their mortgage, especially in 1957. Valid. So <laughs> here I am thinking of like the price of houses around here. <laughs> like this is like where I'm like, you're not gonna pay that off for 30 years. This is like a four bedroom, like yeah, right. nice ass fucking house. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I don't know about nice ass, but you know. Yeah. Nothing that we could afford right now. Oh no, absolutely not. Each of the owners in interviews with police and news media denied knowing about anything about the drum. Arthur Eben told CBS News, quote, it weighed a ton. And I said, Why? Who cares? And he goes on to say, we did roll it into the corner, forgot about it, and it was out of sight, out of our minds for 12 years. And then people, they left it there, and then they left it there. Right. Which I thought was interesting is that people just kept leaving it there until this Mr. Tafa Godi, who had some sense, was like, no, get get it, get rid of it. <laughs> I don't want this 55-gallon I know. massive drum filled with God knows what. Yeah. Well, now we know. Now we know. <clears throat> Uh, police were able to use the numbers on the steel drum to trace where it was manufactured. The numbers on the drum led to a chemical company in Linden, New Jersey. <laughs> the company records indicated that the drum was manufactured in 1965. The company identified the green liquid as a certain dye. It was a halogen green dye used to color the bases of plastic flowers and trees and hasn't been manufactured since 1971. Oh. The pellets in the drum were the type used in making plastic leaves and flowers, like the plastic leaf found with the body. Mm. The purse contained papers in the address book, but the liquid in the drum made it impossible for investigators to read anything that may have been written on them. Yeah. It was all sent to the document analysis unit where Detective Joan Fertner, trying to see if anything was written on the documents that could help determine the identity of the woman. She said that all the evidence was covered in a jelly-like yellowish-brown slime and had an absolute rank smell to it. Fertner and the unit commander, Detective Sergeant Dennis Ryan, left the book in a forensic evidence drying locker to try and dry out some of the moisture. Oh, that's cool. Even after doing this, the book was still difficult to handle because of the smell. The detectives couldn't be in the room longer than five minutes. Oh, my gosh. To handle the book and the smell, Fertner and Ryan wore charcoal-filtered respirators, goggles, rubber gloves, and lab coats as a precaution against potential toxins. Jeez. Because they couldn't determine anything that may have been written on the documents with the naked eye, they used a video spectral comparator. All right, let's see if I can say this all in one breath like you did. <laughs> the BSC exposes a document to a variety of light sources and light filters covering various wavelengths of the light spectrum to aid in visualizing marks and writings that the naked eye can't see. Good job. Thank you. So proud. Thank you. The liquid from the drum had removed most, if not all, the ink from the pages. But over the next few days, after meticulous work from Detective Fertner, she was able to decipher some of the names, addresses, and phone numbers. But when they were contacted by investigators, most of them had moved away. But she was not done yet. <laughs> she continued to analyze the papers in the address book under the v VSC. And finally, Fertner was able to make out some identifying information. She was able to make out a social security number, which was matched back to Reina Angelica Mariquin, who was an immigrant from El Salvador that came to the United States in 1966 and seemed to just vanish in 1969. Oh, interesting. Detective Fertner was also able to find someone else listed in the book and was still living at the same address, a close friend of Reina's. So I've seen this woman's name a couple of different ways. I've seen Kate. I've seen Kathy. I've seen I've seen and. Riketa. Oh. We're going to go with Kathy. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, Kathy Andrade, who met Reina in an English class. She said Reina was one of the most lovely people, and she didn't know why her friend had disappeared for 30 years. She had a feeling that whatever had happened, Reina was met with foul play. Investigators also discovered another name and address in the book. They found an entry for Howard Elkins with an address in Manhattan and phone number. Elkins was the first owner of the house in Jericho and had been a partial owner of Melrose Plastic Company, who manufactured, you guessed it, plastic plants and trees. Mm -hmm. I did guess it. <laughs> in my head. <laughs> the media covered the story of the murdered pregnant woman, which led to an anonymous call to police. Homicide detective Robert Edwards said the caller confirmed what the people at the plant had told them, meaning like what everything was used for. However, the caller didn't know the identity of the woman, but said that Howard Elkins was having an affair in the 1960s with an Hispanic woman that worked in his factory. Oh. Elkins was retired and currently living in Boca Raton with his wife in a gated retirement community. Uh-oh. Police went to go talk to him in Florida and said he wasn't very cooperative. At this point, Elkins was in his 70s and had been living in Florida since selling his house in 1972. 
He denied that any of the materials in the barrel were used with his company, or he even tried to say he couldn't remember. He didn't know. Surprisingly, when asked about the affair, he did say that he did have one. Interesting. But when detectives asked, asked him to describe her, he said he couldn't remember because it was 30 years ago. So did he have an affair on his current life? Like, okay. Yes. Detective Edwards said to him, quote, you can't even describe her. Was she tall? Was she short? Was she fat? Was she skinny? Was she Hispanic? And all he said, I don't remember. Okay. They asked him for a DNA sample. He said no. Sir. <laughs> Eventually, Elkins asked the detectives to leave before his wife came home. Before he left, the detective said that there was not a doubt in their minds that he was involved in this. Yeah, he's too sketchy. Edwards said to him, quote, we're going to leave now, Mr. Elkins, but I'm going to get a court order. I'm going to come back with that court order and I'm going to take your blood. I'm going to match your blood to the dead baby and dead girl. Then I'm going to come back here and arrest you for murder and put you in jail for the rest of your life. Okay. Elkins nodded his head, opened the door and asked the police to leave. Oh, I read this one thing. It kind of goes along with like getting a court order to come in. Okay, so you know how vampires have to be invited in? Sure. Part of the lore is that vampires have to be invited in. Okay. So someone was like, would a vampire be allowed to enter your home if they had a, if they were a cop and they had a search warrant? Because technically you're not inviting them in, but the search warrant is allowing you to go in. I think the search warrant is the invitation. You think that's the invitation to go yes, into the house? Right. Yes. Hmm. I don't know where I stand on the vampire search warrant Ooh. theory. So Elkins was reported missing by his family the next day and was eventually found by his son at a neighbor's house that he was checking in on in his car with what appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound and a shotgun between his legs. And this is the guy that they just spoke to? Uh-huh. Oh. Uh, apparently soon after the detectives had left his house, Elkins went to Wally World and purchased a gun and ammunition. Wow. For those of you that don't know, they don't know Wally World is Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> Elkins left no explanation or final note. They took a sample of Elkins' blood and sent it to LabCorp in North Carolina to compare his DNA to Raina's unborn baby. Mm. Elkins had matching bands with the child and could not be excluded with a 99.93% probability of paternity. Wow. So you are the father. You are the father. Raina came to the U.S. in 1966 and lived in a modest room in a Catholic home for single women. She attended classes at a fashion school and got a job at Melrose Plastic Company making plastic flowers. Kathy told Forensic Files, quote, she had a beautiful personality, always talked about her family and how much she loved her family, and she was in touch with her family, talking about how much she loved New York and her dream to become a U.S. citizen. She was fascinated by New York. She was happy to be here. She was full of life, eager to learn. Uh, she also, quote, was very anxious to become a citizen. She loved this country very much, Kathy added. Aww. One day in 1969, Raina told Kathy that she was pregnant, but didn't tell her who the father was. However, Raina did tell Kathy that the man was married and had three children. Kathy asked her friend if the man was going to marry her, and Raina said eventually he was going to marry her. At the time, Elkins had gotten Raina an apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey. Gotta put up your mistress. Hoboken. Hoboken. I love the name of that town. I do, too. <laughs> Raina was beginning to question if Elkins was actually going to leave his wife and children to be with her. He was not. Mm -mm, they never are going to. Um, Raina was angry and called the house in Jericho. Oh. Elkins' wife, Ruth, answered. And Raina informed her that she was expecting a baby with her <gasps> husband. What would you do if that is a phone call you received? Oh, I would get as many details as I could. Oh, my God. So that when he came home, he couldn't lie. Right. This was the 60s. She didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Elkins called Raina back. And according to Kathy, Raina said, he said, hey, I'm going to kill you. I will never forget you. Forgive. I will never forgive you. Okay, so he's going to kill Raina because Raina told the, the wife about the secret. That's what Raina thinks, yes. So this is all secondhand. So Kathy's talking about how when, you know, Raina calls her and she's frantic and she's like, mm -hmm. he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. She's like, well, what are you talking about? Why would you oh, say this? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and she was like, well, he called me back and that's what he said to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got you. So Raina being in a panic... Uh, that Elkins might kill her or hurt her. Kathy asked why she thought that, and she replied, I don't know, I don't know, I just made a stupid mistake. Raina asked Kathy to stop by her apartment around lunchtime. Kathy went to Raina's apartment, and she wasn't there. There was food left on the table, and the front door was open and unlocked. Mm. Kathy waited three hours, but no one ever came back. Kathy went to the police station to report her friend missing, and they asked if she was family. She said no, she was only a friend, but she informed police that Raina was nine months pregnant and about to have a baby. Oh. Police told Kathy that Rain was probably just out shopping or had run off with her boyfriend. And since Kathy didn't know the name of the father and she wasn't family, police had told her that she couldn't report her missing. Okay, uh, that is so stupid. Also doesn't help that it was the 1960s and the missing woman was an immigrant. Right. So. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know how long Kathy had been there before Raina got there, but I know they were both learning English. Like, 
by the time oh Kathy wasn't from no oh yeah, okay. yeah yeah they met in the English class and Kathy was not the teacher she was not a student okay yeah so by the time she's talking on forensic files she's good English but 30 years ago if she was just learning right and then know? especially if she's the one calling the cops right exactly mm-hmm. did you say 30 years ago Oh, you mean from, from the date? this. Because I was going to say, I mean, in my brain, 70 years ago is 30 years ago. Yeah. Now it's, yeah, a lot longer ago. We don't need to talk about how much longer. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned 30, Mackenzie. Yeah. So it was it yeah. still 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Kathy told Forensic Files, Ah, but Raina, honestly, I feel sorry because there was a future for her, you know? She paid very dearly for that mistake. Investigators believe that one night Elkins lured Raina to the factory after she called his wife and told her about the affair. Elkins beat her to death and took the body to his suburban Long Island home, which is fucking bold. Why the hell would you take it back there? But right. Go off, big guy. He most likely had planned to dump her in the ocean from his boat, but he placed the body in his in the steel drum he got from work, and to ensure it would sink, he weighted it with plastic pellets. Mm. The drum now 350 pounds, Oh, became too heavy for him to move by himself, so he left it in the crawl space. So my question, the guy who moved it out of the crawl space, was he just really strong? He must have, bless you, he must have rolled it or had help. Mm. Because I feel like 350 is heavy, but if you have help... It's not too bad. It's not too bad. But this guy heavy. was obviously by himself because, you know, he killed someone. So he's not going to tell a lot of people that. Right. Yeah. But then he kept it in his fucking house. Mm-hmm. And he lived there for 70, 71, three more years. That's creepy. Yes. Just like knowing it's there would be terrifying. Well, for us normal people. Where the drum remained undisturbed through multiple owners for 34 years. I can see the multiple owners maybe not doing anything about it, especially if it's in a crawl space. Do you really know it's back there? Right. Like, if you're not using it for anything, right. you know, no need for it, then... then you, there were some people who lived there who probably never knew that even existed. The Ebbins. No, they, they all knew about the drum. Oh, they did. They didn't know why it was there. Oh, They, they okay. all said, well, that was there when I moved in. Well, that was oh, there when I moved Oh, I gotcha, I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Except for when they got to what's-his-name, because then he couldn't see that. Oscar Corral covered the story for Newsday New York. He flew down to El Salvador to try to find Reina's family. They lived in San Martin, a small village outside San Salvador. When Reina's 95-year-old mother was told about the news, she completely fell apart. She told him that she'd been having dreams of her daughter for 30 years, and one was even of her in a barrel. Oh, God. Raina's sister, Dora Dora Mariquin, told CBS News, quote, All we want is to bring her body back, and my mother, who is 95 years old, will finally be able to put her daughter to rest. Aww. Raina had left El Salvador because she discovered that her husband was having an affair with another woman and pregnant with his child. Oh. Yeah. So the same situation. She was the other woman. That's wild. Right? She wrote to her family often, sent pictures of her life in New York, and would send them some of the money that she had earned working at the factory. Then one day, the letters suddenly stopped in 1969. At first, her family was angry, but then grew concerned when they continued not to hear from her. So uh, her sister, Dora Mariquin, explained, quote, We put an announcement in the paper in El Salvador, young Salvadorian woman missing in New York. Over the years, Dora and the rest of the family accepted that they might never know what happened to Rena. Not knowing about someone you love is so difficult, Dora said. Dora had borrowed some money from relatives to fly to New York to bring her sister home. When she arrived, she learned that the Hampstead Funeral Home was covering the cost of the br- burial and transportation. Oh, that's sweet. She told Newsday, quote, I've had a great stroke of luck. God is smiling on us. Reina Angelica Mariquin is buried in her home country of El Salvador next to her mother, who died a month after Reina had been buried. Oh, her heart was just waiting for that. Mm-hmm. In conclusion, one more bit of information that's going to pull at your heartstrings. Oh, God, Mackenzie. Investigators found one last message on one of the pieces of paper that they found in Raina's purse, and they thought that it was possibly a message from Raina to Howard. Mm-hmm. When they when the note Howard was, was the guy, yeah, Howard Elkins, yeah, Elkins. Okay, I know I hadn't been I didn't say his last name for some reason. <laughs> when the note was analyzed with the VSC, they determined that the note said, "Don't be mad. I told the truth." Yeah, and you could tell, like, she's very new to writing in English because some of the letters were backwards and, like... Oh. She did a good job. She spelled everything right. Right. But, yeah. Don't be mad. I told the truth. <sighs> yeah. Well, that's scary. It is scary. And it's very sad. It's very sad. It's 100% predictable. Yeah. Like, very cliche, classic, husband kills the mistress because he won't leave the wife. Right. You know? So... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And... Th- 
you know, what kind of I think really sucks more than anything else is that while pretty much everyone's like, yeah, he did it. Mm -hmm. There's no question. There's nothing official. Right. There's no official justice. He's not there. Because he killed himself. He took the easy way out. Yeah, exactly. Ugh. I tried my damnedest to find where the fuck his wife was. Yeah. And what she knew and... But every article I read was she's not responding for comment. One even said she unplugged her phone. Damn. Which I'm like, yeah, she did. I mean, I would have done the exact same thing. A hundred percent. I did see one comment that said that they had heard that she didn't know. And that when she had called, he just like tried to explain it away like it was someone crazy. Like, I mean, at that time, very believable. Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I don't know what. I would love to hear her thoughts because especially because it's not official. And so I'm imagining, I'm like, is his family still out there? Are they saying he's wrongly accused? Right. Like the kids too. They're definitely grown at this point. Exactly. Exactly. There was also, I saw it in a couple places, but not everywhere. Some said that she all, she had another child, which I don't think is true. Raina? Yeah. Because based on like the way that like the family was talking and things like that i don't think she actually had another child oh but some said that people that worked in the factory would see her come in with like a little toddler and would poke fun saying that it was elkins interesting and so if that's true there's like well he's older now but like at the time it would have been some 30 something year old man Right. That is his child. But I don't think that that's true because I really only saw it in a couple of places and it was nowhere like official. But it'd be an interesting twist. Yeah. (laughs) To that story. And then it's like, where would he have gone after everything? Well, right. And that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm like, unless she put him up for adoption before she got pregnant Mm. and all that stuff happened, maybe. Yeah. But I don't know. I didn't, she definitely didn't have any children from El Salvador, at least not what her family said. So. Oof. Yeah. Well, that's sad. It is sad. At least there's like partial justice and at least she's back. Yeah. In El Salvador. Well, and really, if you type this name in, everything's going to pop up about being him being a murderer. So even if the family doesn't think that is true. That's his legacy now. Exactly. Absolutely. It's hard to say no. Right. You didn't do it when the kid is yours. Right. <laughs> right. A hundred percent. And when the barrel is in your house and it wasn't there before you guys moved in. Exactly. It's from your company. Right. Who makes plastics. Right. The kind of plastics that she was found with. Yeah. I did. Someone said that they had tried to talk to the wife and they excluded her for whatever reason or determined she didn't know. And I'm like, yeah, that makes the most sense. If the first time she calls and she hears it, she doesn't know who this woman is. She doesn't know right. where she is. She's had no idea how to find her. Mm-hmm. So it would make a lot more sense for... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for him to do it. Well, duh. Yeah. And you have to be strong to lift someone and put them in a barrel and then fill it and move it to a crawl space. Like, yeah, chances are the wife, not saying that women aren't strong because we are, but chances are she probably couldn't have done all that by herself. Well, you know, women weren't really, like, working out in the 60s No, they yet, weren't. You know, so she was... Probably just a housewife. Yeah. I definitely, out of, you know, everyone involved, I do feel bad for her. Mm -hmm. If this was, like, genuine shock. Yeah. You find out not only your husband cheated, he was with child. Mm Mm-hmm. Killed both of them. Mm Mm-hmm. And then lived the rest of his life as if nothing had happened. Right. Like, that's... Like, how do you have a normal life after something like that? You moved on to Florida, I guess. Or you're a sociopath and you're just... It's another thing. Well... I yeah, because I mean he lost his shit and killed her as soon as he said she said something to the wife. Jeez. Yeah. And I'm like, he didn't just like shoot her. He beat the shit out of her. Oh yeah, it was a personal attack. Right. Yeah. Like he was mad when he did this. Mm-hmm. Asshole. Mm-hmm. Ass. But apparently all his neighbors were like, What? That's so crazy. Like this jovial guy. They're always like that. It's always that. When Absolutely. people find out about something, it's like Oh my god he was the nicest guy ever there's no way he could do something like that it's like i've been watching on hbo max it's called evil lives here i've seen the previews for that it's so fascinating or like it, the little thing for it it's stupid sad stupid fucking sad because so, it's from the spouse's perspective right spouses siblings children oh yeah i think we've talked about it, it depends on who it is but really hearing so many different perspectives like yes you can see like okay if they're abusive and things like that obviously there are signs that something is wrong they recognize that piece but for it to escalate to whatever it is that they did mm-hmm. and then for them to find out later 
I'm like, well, yeah, that it makes perfect sense. Why would you think that that person that you know Mm -hmm. would like if someone said to me right now that you had killed someone, I've been like, bullshit. No, she didn't. Right. No fucking shot that did she do that. I don't care how mad she is or whatever. Right. No way. And even if there was the evidence and things, I might be able to acknowledge it, but I'm like, that still wouldn't erase what I know you as as a person. Yeah. And I think people forget that they are only getting a snippet of information of someone. Mm. And so while it may seem obvious, like, well, he's a killer. How did you not know? Well, I mean, BTK, I think we talked about it for this part, too. He lived a completely normal life. He had a kid. He had a wife. They had zero idea. You know, went how many years without getting caught? Yeah. And so, and, and he, he was really smart too. Right. And some of the people in these stories too, when they do get separated from that person, it might be a few years before oh, yeah. they see or talk to them again. So of course, how, but then their, their thing is that they're stuck on is if I had said something at X point, mm-hmm. or if I'd done something at X point, would things be different now? Would things be different now? And it's, I feel so terrible because all of them are victims of abuse. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, there's nothing you could have done and it's not your fault. So it's truly very interesting to hear this perspective because you hear the perspective from the victim and sometimes you even hear the perspective of the killer himself Mm. and the life he led and what he did. You never hear about the family. Right. And the kind of impact that that left. Yeah. But some of them are like people, kids who got out of cults. Oh, see, that would be fascinating. It's very fascinating. Very, very fascinating. Those are the ones I enjoy. So I tend to recommend it's very, very interesting. Well, 1010, 10, good job on your Thanks. episode. This is short, but I thought it was juicy. It is. No pun intended. Sorry. <laughs> that was so bad. I'm so sorry. Oh <laughs> so... <laughs> it just popped you out. You should feel ashamed. I am. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what tea? No. <laughs> you were so proud last time, too, and I said this isn't going to last. Yeah, I jinxed myself. What spooky tea you pouring, Lauren? So today, like I said, I'm going to talk about the Hudson Valley and the different haunts in the Hudson Valley. So the Hudson Valley is no stranger to the odd and unusual from UFO sightings to the tale of Rip Van Winkle. Oh, nice. Yes. Located in a region that stretches from the Capital District, including Albany and Troy, south to Yonkers in Westchester County, bordering North North Carolina, New York City. The first settlers in New York were the Dutch, and they settled after Henry Hudson's 1609 voyage. They settled along the Hudson River and built homes and foundations, many of which are still around today. Do you think the Hudson River is named after that guy? I'll actually get to it. (laughs) (laughs) The largest estate in the region was the Phillipsburg Manor, built by Frederick Phillipsy in Sleepy Hollow. (laughs) Sleepy Hollow is also in this valley. I know. Look at that. I know. Lori Yarotsky, executive director of the Columbia County Historical Society, said, quote, Ghost stories are in the Hudson Valley's DNA. The human history of this region extends back thousands of years, so there has been ample time for spooky tales to work their way down through the generations. Ooh. I know. So tonight I'm going to talk about the Hudson Valley and just some of the strange that it has to offer. Love it. So you know my obsession with ghost ships. So sailors have spoken of seeing mirages that rise out of the seas, but those more experienced sailors have told stories of the Flying Dutchman. (gasps) Wow, look at all these names. You're dropping all these names, girl. I know. Every time I think of the Flying Dutchman, though, I think of the one from SpongeBob. (laughs) I know how to tie a knot. The Dutch ship Half Moon sailed into what is now New York Harbor on September 2nd, 1609. Is it because it was Dutch? I put that in my notes that he's literally the Flying Dutchman because he was a Dutch man. I know. I had that revelation in my notes as well. I would have never get, said that if you hadn't before said about the Dutch people. Uh-huh. That's, I mean, it makes perfect oh, it sense. Oh, it makes 100% sense. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. That too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I know. We barely started the story. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so they anchored um, near Staten Island. So the ship was captained by a man named Henry Hudson. Ah. He was an English explorer who worked for the Dutch West India Company, which is another big name. Yes, I remember learning about it. Do I remember anything about it? No, No. not a thing. Not a thing. So over the next five weeks, Hudson and a 16-man crew explored the river and the surrounding area. Hudson would be the first one to discover the island of Manhattan. Oh. And obviously the river is named after him. I would hope so. Yep. 
And that's the river that he discovered. Yeah. Hudson and his crew traveled about 150 miles northward. On their journey, they discovered beavers and other furry animals. I wonder if that were otters. There's probably some river otters. Probably. Which they used to trade with the Native Americans that they also encountered on their trip. This is why they're extinct. Where I mean endangered. (laughs) Well, actually not river otters as much as to sea otters. So their observations would eventually lead to the colonization of New Netherland, which was some part of the East Coast. It is obviously... Like the New England area? I think so, but I don't know exactly which part because I tried to look it up and it, I just wasn't interested. Isn't Newfoundland named like Newfoundland? Oh, I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, that's how it's spelled, but... <laughs> We're learning so much today. Uh, I would love a new name there. So fluffy. Oh, the dog. Dude. Oh, yeah, 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 the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, do you want to explore new land? No, 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 no. I want a big... I w- I'm, like, getting really close to compromising and willing to live in the cold if it means that I can get some big fluffy dogs. So one day of their journeys and exploration, September 6, they were attacked by natives, with one of Hudson's crew members, John Coleman, being struck in the neck with an arrow and dying. Ouch! The next day, they buried him on shore in what is today Brooklyn. Huh. On September 18th, Hudson and his men had a feast with a group of Native Americans in the Catskills. In his log, Hudson described them as, quote, a very good people. And when they supposed that I would not stay overnight with them for fear of their bows, they broke the bows and arrows and threw them into the fire. Oh, I know. Nice. So on their return trip at the same spot as before, they were attacked again, this time killing about a dozen of their attackers. After some weird booping around, Hudson and his crew returned back home. Booping around? Yeah, booping. Be booping? I just put booping. Or be bopping? It could be either. You can bop, you can boop. You can do whatever you want around. But so they did that. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff that I didn't go into with him. Like, he wasn't returning where he was supposed to. And he left his wife in Amsterdam because he was supposed to go there. They were kind of held as like, it's not a hostage, but like a, like that's where they're living. So they assume you're going to return there. It was just a whole, Hudson's not a great guy. Ah. So (laughs) he went on to captain three additional expeditions. So four in total. But something about Hudson, he wasn't a super well-liked guy. (laughs) Every one of his crews in his four voyages mutinied against him at some point. Damn. The most intense mutiny being on his last voyage. He had angered the crew when he suggested that they continue to sail during the winter months, though it was known that these months were the deadliest. Yeah, I'd be pissed. Pissed. This is what caused the mutiny. They set Hudson adrift among the ice floes in the Hudson Bay where he perished. You know what? That's you want to go fucking explore and carry on in the winter? You go ahead. Yep. So he died. Hmm. Upon returning to land, none of the crew members faced any punishment. I mean. Yeah. Since then, Hudson has been doomed to voyage around the world in search of justice, doomed to meander the seven seas for eternity. Since his death, many stories have started popping up in the Hudson Valley and on the Hudson River of the Flying Dutchman and his ship. It has been sighted at the foot of the Palisades and Point No Point, which is another place, (laughs) usually heading towards Tappan Zee at nightfall. Sometimes it makes for the Catskills or stops near Albany. The Dutchman name, though so mainstream now, comes from the fact that Hudson was indeed a Dutchman. God, that's insane. I know. <laughs> that's just, I can't believe it. Like, I'm, but I'm also imagining the Flying Dutchman from fucking Spongebob. Right. I'm like, I don't know what I thought Dutch was. No, I don't either. It's just like, the Flying Dutchman, it's just, it's, it's just a word. Like, that's what he is. Right. And then. He's a pirate who has died and is now under the ocean. Isn't that also the name of the ship of the bad guys in parts of the Caribbean? Probably. A lot of the things with this reminded me of, like, things from Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, yeah. Flying Dutchman. I'll get to a part where it's called something else, too. It's weird that, like, it's being talked about, like, on a river, though. Yeah. Because I'm used to imagining an ocean. Yes, exactly. The never-ending oceans. Yes. A ghostly three-mass, white-sailed wooden ship is seen haunting the waters of the Hudson River. Unlike other ghost ships, this one is usually seen in the early hours of 7 a.m. Why are you up? (laughs) <laughs> either being washed in the warm light of the morning or being barely visible through the haze of a foggy morning. Mm. Those who have seen the boat say that it has a spooky light and an unearthly glow to it. Those who have witnessed the ghost ship say that it materializes out of nowhere. It is translucent and the crew on board seems to be going about their normal activities, but the ship is dead silent. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to make sure you saw what I did there. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Other times, the chants of the sailors or cry of help from the crew can be heard on the wind that whips over the water. Why are they stuck on the boat? He was an asshole. I don't know. That really sucks for them. Yeah. But it's like Jack Sparrow's crew. They're all stuck on the boat. Or what's his name? Well, but they, like, 
they traded him. Like, they traded something, I'm pretty sure. Their souls. Something like that. Like the one with the, all the tentacle yes, beard thingy? Yes, he's Davy Jones. Yes. So then all of his crew members, when the sun or, like, the moon hits them, they all turn into, like, the yeah. skeletons. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so they've sold their soul, which is why they're stuck on that boat. Yeah. So at least they gave something. Yeah. These guys tried to get rid of him, and now they're stuck for eternity. Yeah, that really sucks. That sucks. I it must have fucked up later on. <laughs> I also think of SpongeBob where um, the Flying Dutchman opens a locker and he goes, Davy Jones locker. <laughs> I just recently watched that episode. Did you? <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. <laughs> Lila, I was Lila. just going to do that. <laughs> That's my favorite thing. Okay. So those who have seen the ship usually report a sense of discomfort or foreboding while in its presence. Duh. Mm-hmm. Edgar Mayhew Bacon <laughs> wrote a book titled Chronicles of Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow. And in his book, he recounts a supposed spotting of this ghostly ship. Quote, late on a moonlit evening several years ago, as two friends sat on the rocks by Kingland's round, ta- round Tower at the Old Quarry and looked down upon the river, their attention was attracted to a schooner that moved swiftly and silently past the point. While the friends were looking at this inviting craft, she disappeared, vanished as completely as though she'd been engulfed by the Tappan Zee, leaving not a single spar to mark the place where she went down. So it just pops up and pops away. Well, the other one in the Pirates of the Caribbean does too, kind of. You can see it a little bit better, though. <laughs> the ship is also often commonly spotted right before heavy storms, seemingly as a foreboding for bad weather ahead, though interestingly, it wasn't present before Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So it's been present before, like, every big storm except that one. Well, that was also the same year as Sandy Hook, so Flying Dutchman said, fuck it, you guys are on your own. Probably. <laughs> like, yeah, this is a little payback for that one. And During- not doing anything about it. Yeah, it's very sad. So during those severe storms, sailors have spotted Hudson being blown about in the storm, and he has been spotted in or near New York Harbor on more than one occasion. One legend with him goes that every 20 years since 1609, he and his crew return to the Catskill Mountains and Castle Island, so two separate locations, to bowl nine pins with the gnomes of the mountain. The crash of the pins is usually disguised as the sound of thunder. Sometimes that thunder is so loud that it can be heard all the way down the Hudson River Valley in New York City. You know what the flying Dutchman makes me think of? What? It makes me think of um, in Scooby-Doo when the monsters are unleashed and the flying Dutchman and the ghost ship that, like, sails through the city. I'll have to watch it again. Are you talking about the live one? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably why I don't really remember. I didn't like the live one that much. (laughs) First, you leave early on Saturday and hang out with me, and now you're bashing this movie Wow, wow, I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> Pivoting, as we always do, <laughs> um, with Scooby-Doo. So last night we were on TikTok and Joe, I was on Not yours. anymore. Not on, not on mine. <laughs> well, yeah, but I was on Joe's. And it was like a zombie shaggy talking. And so he was saying how everything that they did was like they had died. Hmm. And now they're in purgatory. Mm-hmm. And all of the people that they're saving after they pulled off and realize it's a human, it's because these are ghosts who forgot who they were. And then as they figure out that they're the human, they're able to kind of like move on. So they're in the afterworld helping all these people who are stuck in purgatory move on after finding out like what has kept them to this earth. So like them being a bad person has kept them tied here. And once they realize like, oh, I did this bad thing, they're able to come to terms with it and leave. So what they're saying for him is like they were driving one day and they like ran off the road in the mystery machine and they crashed and they all died in it. And so when they wake up, Scooby, they found this talking dog. He's their spirit guide. And so that's why they're with him the whole time. And the reason why none of them can go up is because Fred's too concerned about being the leader and he never gets over the fact that he wants to be the leader. Daphne is too obsessed with how she looks. Uh, Velma is too obsessed with insecurities. And then Shaggy is like too like focused on how scared he is so they said the reason they are never able to move on to like the next life is because they all hold these things that are keeping them on this plane because they're not able to leave because they like can't get past these things that are keeping them here isn't that a fun theory that's a lot i know but i watched it last night and i was like ooh, that's good that's like when they used to say that fucked up shit about the kid shows if you watched them like rugrats them all being like stillborn or whatever yes that one <laughs> And all Winnie the Pooh are all different, yeah, like disorders. Same with the princesses. I watched one about the princesses oh. where Belle is Stockholm syndrome. Duh. Well, duh. Um, they said Ariel was like 
a hoarder, so OCD. Mm-hmm. Um, what were the other ones? I can't remember the other ones, but yeah. Sleeping Beauty narcolepsy? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get back to Hudson and his people. So Hudson and his crew are said to haunt Castle Island on the nights that the Three Points Festivals commence. The Three Points Festival, I looked it up, is apparently a music festival in Miami. Interesting, full circle. I don't think that's what they're talking about. It's just some other Three Points Festival. I was going to say, I feel like that's a little far away to be happening for this ship to just like pop up. Right. So I think it's, well, it happens at Castle Island. So I assume it's just like how I've pictured it was like, like um, Renaissance Uh, Festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the crew will look. Does the castle have Three Points? Oh, not smart. Thank you. So the crew attends the festival, and when they do, they usually try to challenge people there to contests of physical prowess. But they're ghosts. Yeah. I don't know. I guess maybe they're able to be formed into humans at this point. Hmm. But there is another captain who many believe may be the one behind the ghostly ship, and that would be Captain Vanderdecken. Hmm. So this one is believed to date back to 1641. Vanderdecken was rounding the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, bound for India or perhaps the Dutch settlement on the Hudson, when his ship encountered an awful storm. Vanderdecken still ordered his men to sail into the storm, but tragically the ship was thrown into the rocks nearby with the whole crew perishing. It is said that before the waters took him, Vanderdecken shouted an oath out to God, saying that he would make the voyage around the Cape if he had to sail until Judgment Day, quote, in spite of heaven and hell. Legend goes that, for his blasphemy, he is doomed to sail the seas forever, only allowed on land once every seven years. See, that is the story from the movies. Yes. Apparently, the curse of his can be broken if he finds a girl who will love him. That's also, that's like the plot of Pirates of the Caribbean. So they took it from, from Andrew Deccan. Yes. Funny thing is that people that have met odd strangers in the Terrytown bars have thought, quote, maybe these are members of the crew trying to get someone to break the spell. Oh. I know. <laughs> Those who have seen the ship say it's a bad omen. Many sailors have reportedly gotten sick or even died after seeing the ship, with others suffering fatal accidents. So what is the ship really? So there are obviously different thoughts about what it's like what it is and why it's here. Mm-hmm. Some say it's a lingering haunting, victims of nautical accidents who are now eternally sailing. Others believe that witnesses experienced a group hallucination or shared illusion of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> but old Dutch settlers believe that the ship was a demonic power sent to exterminate the local populace. Damn. Yes. So that's our ghost ship. Oof. So then we also have ghost imps of Donderberg. Okay. <laughs> Donderberg Mountain overlooks the Hudson River, just a bit above Sleepy Hollow in the Hudson Highlands. I when thought I you were going to tell us about Sleepy Hollow. I will get to it. Oh, okay, cool. Can you let me tell my story, Mackenzie? I didn't know how many there were. There's a couple. So even before the Revolutionary War, ghost imps, led by Dorg, haunted the area between Havistraw Bay and Polypal Island. You can explain who those are? What they are? They're just areas. No. Oh. <laughs> Dorg. And the imps. I will describe the imps. I think Dorg's just their leader. He's also an imp? I think so. Okay. So this area, the deepest part of the river, is known as World's End. Also from the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Oh, there's also a movie. Called World's End? hmm I believe it. But yeah, there's one like Pirates of the Caribbean and World's End or something like that. Oh, I don't know the, those ones. I just know the first one because it was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot. <laughs> they had like five. There was a lot. And they, not everyone was the same in them. Jack Sparrow pretty much stayed throughout. Yeah, but the last one they made. Oh, um, where the guy gets taken by like the mermaid. Oh, I haven't watched <laughs> that one often enough to know details of the plot. I just know that um, what's her name is in it. Kira Knightley. No, she's not in it anymore. Orlando Bloom's in that one. The last one? Mm-hmm. Like, 99% sure. I don't think so. I think he's in it. Because, um... He helps the guy who gets taken by the mermaids. Or the sirens, I guess. Maybe I haven't seen the last one. I don't think you have, (laughs) now that we're talking about it. I don't think I have either. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm asleep over watching Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Utopia. (laughs) I actually love those movies. Me too. Anyhow. (laughs) So these imps are sometimes referred to as goblins and were the ever-present, quote, hidden people, a term commonly seen in folklore. They were the spirits of those who drowned when boats weren't as safe. Today they appear in order to warn ships that navigating through the tides can be dangerous and that the ships need to be careful. So what's interesting is that the Hudson River is one of the only rivers that has tides and waves. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Is it because it's just that big? I don't know, but people back then used to say that it was the river that flowed both ways. Uh, because the waves would make it look like it was going the other direction. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. 
So other legends say that the imps will send storms to wreak havoc upon the ships who have failed to acknowledge the mysterious powers of the river. I mean, fuck around and find out. Legend goes that skippers must tip their hat to the ghostly imps of the Hudson Highlands for protection on their journey or tie a horseshoe to the mast of their ship. Or the imps will call upon a storm of the river, making sure the storm has devastating consequences. What odd objects. I know. <laughs> I know. I think the hat tip is a good one. Yeah, that one makes sense. That's an acknowledgement. The horseshoe lost me. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> The imps are never clearly seen in the storm. First, hands of mist will start no. to rise from the water. No. Until you can slowly make out faces and forms in the storm. No. <laughs> the Native Americans knew them as river spirits. Some believe the main imp, not the Deweg guy, but some other main imp, was John Coleman, the guy who was shot in the neck with an arrow. Mm. Mm-hmm. You may also be unlucky well, enough. Well, master now. God. You may also be unlucky enough to see the storm ship. As you're passing through. This is a ghostly ship crewed by an army of imps. Is this all on the Hudson River or near it? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, the Hudson River's popping. <laughs> 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 so then we have the ghost of Major Andre. So Benedict Arnold had a fellow spy named Andre. Remember when you had a crush on a guy named Andre? Yes, I do. <laughs> he seems like he's doing great in his life right now. He's cut his hair. He's in the military. Oh, my God. You follow him? <laughs> yeah, we still follow each other on Facebook. That's so Honey. Yeah, so oh his stuff God. will pop up. I'll like it. He'll like my stuff. Yeah. Aw. Uh-huh. Yeah. Past love. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, I really had a thing for the guys with the long swoopy hair. Yeah, you did. I really did. I mean, his is covered, but it's still there. Joe does not have long swoopy hair. Maybe not as long as the first ones you've been with. In high school, he had long swoopy hair. But his hair, it swoops. Yeah, I like it. So, How do you know? <laughs> it's always under a hat. He takes it off in the house when he's with me. Oh, I was going to say, I've never seen him. T- I have seen him with his hat off, obviously. Obviously, I didn't let him get married in it. Yeah, but you did let him wear it at the reception. Afterwards, it was a compromise. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage is all about compromise. See, that's bold of you because I don't trust anyone that just wears the hat and is constantly wearing the hat and then i'm like well what if you don't look good without the hat on our second date i saw him without the hat okay good yeah we watched a movie and he took it off and i was like who are you he's gonna give himself like balding before uh his grandpa used to try to convince him to eat tomatoes and mushrooms he hates those he said you'll bald if you don't eat mushrooms and tomatoes and he said i'd rather be bald than eat these things so well at least that's why he started wearing the hat because he's like if i get bald (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he also didn't like other th- it's okay we're gonna I get it was his ears it's that too okay <laughs> <laughs> and his forehead my husband's very attractive but there's a lot of stuff going on there he has hair on his forehead i know i know he has hair covering his forehead it's not on his forehead <laughs> <laughs> yes he's got bangs <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Ew, that is weird to think about that all guys who have stuff here they have bangs they have bangs ew yeah okay so benedict arnold <laughs> He had a fellow spy named Andre, who was a dapper officer in the British Army. Dapper? Dapper. While he was on his way to deliver West Point plans to the British, he was caught with six pages of information that Arnold had given him on how to take the American fortress. So he was detained by a man in a Hessian coat who asked him, which party are you from? To which Andre said, the lower party. Which refers to the part of Westchester from Irvington and beyond. Is this Benedict? No, that's not Benedict Arnold. Not him. But he's working with him. Yeah. The traitor. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That story sounded familiar. (laughs) So the lower part, which he said he was from, was under British control. The upper part was American or rebel controlled, and the middle was no man's land. So he thought he had been caught by an ally. Pause. Yes. (laughs) Say that again. The upper part of New York. Oh. Or Westchester, wherever we are in this. Oh. Okay. No, I'm... not of the United States. <laughs> You're thinking of the whole 13 colonies. No. <laughs> no. Sorry. Okay. Continue. Continue. <laughs> so he thought he had been caught by an ally, mm-hmm. which is why he said, oh, I'm from the lower part, which yeah. is the British part. That is when the man who turned out to be John Paulding and his compatriots revealed that Andre had been tricked. I don't know who John Paulding is. I know John Paul Jones. He's a compatriot. Climb down off your mount. We are American patriots, they shouted. Thus, Andre was captured and hanged for his crimes. Damn. The tree he was hanged on was located in Terrytown. Years later, that same tree was hit by a violent burst of lightning and split down the middle. <gasps> yep. From that moment, it was believed that Andre's spirit continues to haunt the grounds. Some have reported seeing a formless gray shadow moving about the neighborhood, while others have claimed that they have heard the word halt being said in a soldierly tone. Someone 
told me to halt, I'd run. <laughs> First, I would stop and look at them like, who? Says- if I heard a ghostly halt. How would you know it was ghostly? Because you don't see the person. <laughs> you hear Holt and you don't see the person. You have, oh. <laughs> You're such a dork. <laughs> it's a ghostly Holt. That's a ghostly Holt. Holt. <laughs> I'm thinking it's like not in your peripherals. You can't see. Yeah, but then you look around and you don't see anyone. But my face would say, who the fuck says Holt? <laughs> You'd be looking at the ghost and be like, I'm not scared. I'm just wondering why you chose those words. <laughs> like, of all the words you could have chosen, tell me to stop. That's the one you went with? I'm sorry, is this 1776? What? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Some have even heard the galloping of horse hooves. Interestingly, they have also never heard these further south than the tree. So they always stop at the tree. Mm-hmm. Is it, and it's it's not the Sleepy Hollow guy? No, not yet. Different. Yes. So two two horses. Yes. Okay. Which I will get to soon. Okay. Jonathan Cruck, master storyteller and author of the book Legends and Lore of Sleepy Hollow in the Hudson Valley, says, quote, the only way to stop him, Andre, is to use the words that got him caught. Says Holt. Cruck. <laughs> if you see him, call out, what party are you from? And that should do it. Hmm. So if you hear Halt, just yell out, what party are you from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would be like a great like little secret code for like a... Like a speakeasy? Yeah, like sneak in something. That would be. Mm -hmm. Today, that tree no longer stands, but instead there is a monument dedicated to the major in Patriots Park, which I think he was a traitor. Right. Why do we have something dedicated to him? It's the same way we have all those fucking Confederate bullshit in the South. Right. I'm like, no. Correct. That goes against our history. Uh, Yeah, well, (laughs) (laughs) there's a lot of monuments and things that we have that we should probably get rid of. Yeah. Yeah. So a ghost girl is known to haunt Leeds in Greene County. The story goes that sometime in the mid-18th century, a servant girl was working for a very wealthy family. At some point, she ran away from the house and the master chased her. He ended up catching her and he tied her to his horse. When the horse bolted, the poor girl was dashed to death. <gasps> the master is found guilty, but it seems... seems like the worst way to do it. Yeah. Ugh. Uh, he was found guilty, but it seems his only true punishment was that for the remainder of his years, he had to wear a noose around his neck. So that's it. Just like a form of public humiliation that he killed someone. But they, that's all they did. Oh, I didn't really learn this lesson with that one. Yeah. So the spot where the girl was killed is now known as Spooky Hollow or Spooky Rock. It is said that at any given night when passing by this area, you might encounter a host of specters, including, of course, the young girl. But you will see her being dragged by a spectral horse. Whee! So this may be more than a legend, though. So there was a servant girl named Anna Dorothea Swartz, and she did die in the same fashion in 1755. Her master, William Salisbury, was one of the wealthiest men in the area. And seven years after her death, there was an indictment drawn up against William. Mm -hmm. But it was officially ignored. Um, Wow, I can't believe they were honest about the fact that they ignored it. I think that was like a a term. Yeah, officially we are ignoring this. Ignored, because that was in quotes. I would love a stamp that just says ignored. ignored. <laughs> All right. Now, when you think of Sleepy Hollow, of course, we think of the Headless Horseman penned by Washington Irving. Ichabod. Ichab- Ichabod Crane. That guy. So the town of Sleepy Hollow is often described as having, quote, a drowsy, dreamy influence, which draws many different people like artists, musicians, and even millionaires here due to its natural beauty, but also has an indescribable feeling that makes it feel mysterious. There's a street area around here called Sleepy Hollow. Oh, interesting. One interesting tale is that Pete Seeger wrote about the majestic muddy waters, which prompted him to want to clean it up. People have reported feeling Seeger's presence along the river, saying that feeling it inspired them to want to pick up the trash and clean it as well. Well, I'm trying to think of who Pete Seeger is. Not a... He sings that song, right? Um, I don't know. Turn the page. Is that him? Let me see. Turn the page. (laughs) That guy? No. (laughs) Yeah, he's an artist. Which side are you on? Oh, that's his most famous. Oh, my God. Do you know that song? No, but it's probably from the story you just told. Oh, Bob Seger is Turn the Page. Oh. Okay, so that's uh, Pete Seeger. He sings Oh, Susanna. Because <laughs> we're not going to keep that in because that could get us in trouble. Right. <laughs> okay, so back to Irving. It is believed that he got inspiration for the scary tale of the Headless Horseman from the Headless Haitian. Haitian. How did... It's not Haitian. It's not Haitian. No. I think you were right with Haitian. Haitian. You were close. Just I the... was close. From the headless Haitian. A Revolutionary War character was believed to have lost his head during battle. 
That's not the story I know. I'll get to it. So this man is believed to be Christian Range, and during the Battle of White Plains in 1776, he lost his head. So it's 1776. Washington's army was retreating after having lost the Battle of Long Island. Washington ordered his troops to prepare a hasty defense near White Plains, which was a small settlement on the northern outskirts of Manhattan. It was the eve of Halloween. This is when the Americans encountered a combined force of British and Hessian soldiers. The Hessians spearheaded the assault. Hours of fighting commenced, and in the end, Washington's troops broke contact and fled, leaving behind an estimated 50 dead American soldiers on the battlefield. Wow. Several days later, in the New York countryside, Lieutenant Ephraim Fino assumed command of one lone artillery battery on top of a hill overlooking White Plains. Fino fired a single cannonball at the advancing Hessian troops. That one cannonball decapitated one soldier, <gasps> killed a horse, and effectively ended the assault. Um, You know what that reminds me of? Hmm. The first Final Destination. The last scary movie I ever watched. With a cannonball? What? With a cannonball? Just listen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a part where they're by a train and you know how like if one person escapes death, yeah. it goes to the next one in line. Mm-hmm. So they all had just, you know, done some big escape and they, you know, this one guy was really excited and he's, he's standing up and as something goes by like a wind blows a piece of metal comes in and just decapitates him oh like the office would say his kappa was detained. <laughs> oh so and i'm the loser <laughs> all of my office fans will understand so um this whole report about the cannonball yeah was reported in a journal by general william heath there is also evidence that a local family took the headless body and buried it at the old dutch cemetery that was nice of them. That was nice of them. Well, I think they thought it was him, like their son, like someone oh. they knew. They just happened to be local to the area. So the Hesh... What if it's not him, Mackenzie? What if their son comes back? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like that one story I covered where the guy died in the fire. He did not. And then they buried him. Whoa. And then who he was claimed to come back. Yeah. And I was like, hey, this is me. And they're like, no, nah, we buried you. And he's like, no, this is me. And they're like, we're gonna keep the guy buried. <laughs> so <laughs> they do that, didn't they? They're like, we're not gonna accept you. We know what we did. <laughs> so the Hessians were believed to be a terror throughout the Hudson Valley while alive, attacking unsuspecting locals. During the American Revolution, Britain relied heavily on German auxiliary forces known as the Hessians. They helped bolster the army. They were I was viewed- about to ask who those people are. <laughs> yeah, so they were viewed by the Americans as bloodthirsty uh, marauders who killed for money. Around 30,000... that it took so long for our opinion of Germany to change. <sighs> Love my German heritage, but... <laughs> yeah, maybe you're a Hessian. Around 30,000 Hessians won the war. (laughs) They also fought in the Battle of Bennington, Long Island, and Trenton. The Battle of Trenton was one where George Washington led troops across the Delaware River. The one on Christmas. What? The famous painting? Yes. Mm -hmm. On Christmas to kill these Hessians. (laughs) The headless Hessian is also said to return to the scene of the battle that cost him his life. So Bacon told the story of this headless man by saying, quote, A few years ago, a sober and careful citizen returning from the distant saloon with a pitcher of beer, which he was expecting to drink in the bosom of his family, was dragged upon the bridge by invisible hands, though it was clear moonlight and flung over the high parapet into the water of the Picantico, where he swam for some time, being miraculously unable to find the shore and was at last rescued by his neighbors. So Irving took this story. Okay. The one of the man being thrown okay. and the headless man. Okay, that, so that, I was like, wait, it sounds so close. <laughs> yes. He mixed it with indigenous tales, local characters, German fairy tales, a little bit of Robert Burns, I don't know who that is, and cobbled it all together to form his tale of the headless horseman searching for his head. So that makes sense with like the bridge that you have to cross that the headless horseman can't cross over, yep. how he's holding his head, which is a pumpkin, which could make sense because this whole battle happened around Halloween. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Did this, the last guy lose his head? The headless horseman? The the one in oh, the bridge. No, but they're saying that he was trying to return home and he was flung over by invisible hands. Oh, okay. Who but they he... believe to be this headless horse. So he took that story. Yes. Mixed it with the headless horse, like the guy who got his head blown off by the cannonball. Mixed all of the other things together. Sprinkle a little something. And formed Sleepy Hollow, the Headless Horseman. Got it. Okay. So Ichabod Crane, Katrina Van Tassel, and Brom Bones, all from the original story, also came from local lore. Hmm. Yes. Which I didn't find, so I did not go into that. Oh. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we have just a few other spooky ghosts that I wanted to cover. 
So the Spook Rock Road in Columbia County is also home to another legend. I think it's also the one close to where that girl was dragged. Mm -hmm. So this one centers around a Mohican princess. She and her lover were forbidden to wed. Always. She was in classic tale. I know. <laughs> she instead was to wed someone her family wanted her to marry, even though she didn't love that man. Of course. So she and her lover ran away together. Love is love. They <laughs> love is love. They eventually reached Claverack Creek and rested on a boulder there. The couple's treachery enraged the Skyholder God, so he sent down torrential rain upon the couple, drowning them. Damn. It is said that at times you can still hear you can still hear her moans of death as she is being carried away, and sometimes at night you might even catch a glimpse of her. No thanks. Mm -mm. A wailing woman in white warns people to go inside before a winter storm. That's nice. Yeah. A rowboat fellow forever tries to get back to the shore. That sucks. So this legend <laughs> refers to Rombout Von Dam. <laughs> <laughs> he partied late Saturday night and swore to row home to Spietten Duval after, but that would be a violation of the Sabbath. Because I guess it would be going into Sunday and he'd be working mm. on a Sunday. An angel is said to have cursed him. Other stories say he drowned, but either way, he is occasionally seen forever trying to row home. See, the Jewish, it's confusing because the Jewish Sabbath is Saturday. Maybe it is Saturday. I don't know. He was doing something that violated the Sabbath. <laughs> so maybe it was Saturday and he shouldn't have been drinking and rowing. And he was Jewish. I don't know if he was Jewish. His last name is Von Dam. He's probably not Jewish. Probably not. <laughs> but either way, whenever his Sabbath is, <laughs> he violated could be, it. It could have been Wednesday for all we know. <laughs> Could have been a Black Sabbath. There's no way to know. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Would it be our podcast if there weren't really bad jokes? Uh, that was a good one, though. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Washington Irving himself has been seen in a window of his bedroom, one that faces the Hudson River. He is also seen in his study. Okay. Bonnie Ben was a woman who loved green apples. Sounds like the beginning of a riddle. <laughs> <laughs> How many green apples did she eat? <laughs> she was suffering from a lost love and was wandering through an orchard. She ate too many green apples and died. So her ghost still haunts the orchard. So, fun fact. <laughs> eating 20 apple cores will kill an adult. While the, eating less can result in paralysis, coma, and brain damage. The core or just apples in general? Uh, like the whole apple. So with the core and the seeds because the you're seeds... are supposed to eat that part. Right, you're not. All right. But at times people did. I'll get to that in a second. Okay. But so apple seeds do contain cyanide. Oh. So eating 20 apple cores with all the seeds in them will kill you because there's enough cyanide. The one single apple seed will not kill you. But eating like 20 apple cores will. So, of course, where I read this fun fact, I scrolled to the comments. And of course, people are like, I used to eat five apples, core and all, when I was younger. And I'm still kicking. My grandma did it and she lived to be 99 years old. And I'm like, good for you, but you didn't eat 20. Right. And all I'm thinking about is like, that would be a really great way to get cyanide undetected. <laughs> right. I feel like they ate a lot of apples. Yeah. Like you could just get 20 apples, get take out the seeds, crush it up. It, that cyanide would still be detected in your system. Right. But you wouldn't have a record of you buying any. Oh, that's true. Yeah. But then they would see you bought, you bought like 500 apples. You don't need to buy 500. 20. You could just collect them. Yeah, you would just need 20. Yeah. I think a bushel has over 10. <laughs> Maybe not 20. You might have to go to the store like a couple weeks in a row so it doesn't seem super sus. Yeah, you'd have to like, yeah. Well, Buy really, you'd actually have to start buying apples a lot. Like years in advance. Yeah, you really got to plan this one out. You got to start buying apples to the point where it wouldn't be weird that you bought apples. I buy apples and then I eat them with peanut butter. Delicious. So one last legend. <laughs> so Captain Kidd was a pirate who was believed to have buried gold and treasures along the Hudson River. Nice. He would usually stop his boat at or near Terrytown, where he would then have dealings with rich local merchants. Terrytown feels like a familiar Yeah. It's story also plot. haunted. It does. Yeah. It does. It's haunted, so that could be why. Hmm. It's like kind of with Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Hudson Valley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his crew would have to draw sticks when a treasure was buried. The loser would be killed and their body would be placed on top of the treasure chest before they were buried in a way to repel intruders. Oh. <laughs> Is that where you got the short end of the stick? Oh, maybe. Write that down. I want to look that up, too. <laughs> Captain Kidd was hanged by the British on May 23rd, 1701. Not for piracy, but for him murdering one of his crew members. No, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. 
He and his crew now haunt the area where the treasure is buried, still guarding it to this day. And that's what I never understood about burying your treasure. You can't use it. Why are you burying it somewhere? I always assumed that they were burying it to, like, get it off their person, and then they were going to come back for it later. Yeah, but they never do. Well, yeah, because they get killed. Yeah, well, stupid. Well, yeah, but uh, (laughs) let's see who's doing it. Men. (laughs) Many of the buildings in the Hudson Valley are also extremely and incredibly haunted, but I didn't want to include them in my tales tonight. I wanted to include non-house haunted things. Okay. So there you have it. The haunted Hudson Valley. That's... It feels like a nice little history lesson spun together. I know. Stuff. So I liked I it. I really enjoyed looking into it. So it was kind of short, like the stuff I found, but I was like, that was fascinating. Yeah. No, that was good. I liked that. Thank I liked you. the connections to things. I know. That was fun. That was it really was fun. fun. Yeah. It was fun. And I really liked the Sleepy Hollow because I saw that and I was like, yes. Yes. We drove by Sleepy Hollow when we went up to New York that one time and I wanted to stop by, but we didn't have time. And mom and grandma didn't want to stop after we had, on the way there, been in the car for seven and a half hours, and we're going to have a seven and a half hour drive back. I mean, I get it. So they didn't want to stop. I get it. We also drove by a sign for Woodstock. They didn't want to stop. We were heading to the funeral at that (laughs) point. Well, yeah. So it couldn't really stop. Yeah. But yeah. So that's the Hudson Valley. That was good. That was very, that was very interesting. And isn't a lot of that like it just kind of takes you out of New York, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, and it's also it's fun because it's like you have the the basis for the legends and yeah. how the things that we recognize them to be actually came about, which yeah. is always really fun. So yeah, very good. New very York, nice. a different take on New York this time yeah. than we had last time. I don't remember. You covered the oh, blackout? I was, uh, there was one singular murder. Yeah, the one murder. The one murder in the whole blackout. And then I don't remember what I covered that day. But yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. As always, rate and review us on everything and let us know. Yeah. Um, you don't have to let us know either. You can just rate and review us and just sure, be anonymous you, and make us happy. Yeah, if you don't want a sticker, if you're not interested in that, but you do want to give us some props, like that would be really kind. Um, all stickers have been put in the mail and have been sent. So if you did not receive yours, let me know. But they are all out there. They should be with their owner. And remember, we're saying this a whole week ahead of time. Yeah, that's true, So too. when you're hearing this, just know they've been sent out like two weeks before you're hearing it. Exactly, exactly. Um, and we have a lot of stickers. So please, even if you want to rate and review us and then delete it no. <laughs> and send it to us, Lauren, we have to get rid of these stickers. If you just want a sticker. <laughs> no, but it would be, you can go on Spotify and click the five stars and it takes like three seconds and yeah. it would be so much appreciated. And then we'll give you a sticker. You get more than one. Yeah, more than one sticker. You get three. <laughs> so thanks for listening. <laughs> Stay scary. Stay safe. <laughs> <laughs>